Well, hello and welcome to the On It, Not In It interview series podcast. I'm your host, Todd Eppert, and today I'm joined by Brian Wilson, who is the owner, president, and CEO of North American Coding. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to kick us off with a brief background as to who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, so I am, like you mentioned, the owner, president, and CEO of North American Coding Laboratories. We are a optical coding laboratory that does manufacturing service work for our customers. So rather than being a traditional manufacturer, taking a bunch of parts and making something else and selling it, our business model is to take a customer's part, bring it in, give a value-added service, and then return it. So a little bit different than a standard manufacturer, but a very niche market as well. The optical coating industry is growing, and it's an exciting place to be right now. Yeah, great. I, I understand that industry a little bit. Like you said, you're adding value to an existing manufactured product. What kind of service, just out of curiosity, what kind of industries do you technically serve or what kind of uh, um, like like industries are you in or you're serving your customers? Uh, good question. So we're in a very broad range of industries. These coatings are used in a lot more places than most people are aware of. Um, quick history of the company was started in 1974. So we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. It was started by my father. I was groomed to be second generation. So I'm a second generation entrepreneur, if you will. Um, when my father started the company back then, our business model was only doing coatings for eyeglasses and sunglasses. And that was the model for many years until we had an opportunity to get into what we call our industrial optics, which is everything that's not those two things. Um, and that now encompasses many different areas like uh, aerospace, uh, medical devices, uh, consumer electronics. We do a lot of work with lasers. Uh, and an area that's a particular growth recently is the LIDAR, self-driving vehicles, and augmented and virtual reality. So we work in all those areas, as well as many more military, uh, aviation, um, you name it, we're kind of in it everywhere. So it's a really fun and unique place to be because no two days are the same around here. Excellent. So I appreciate that little bit of a history because I was going to ask you my question is, why did you start your own business? But the answer is really you were kind of born into it, right? That's correct. Uh, so, so yeah, so um, maybe I'll ask a different question. So how did you feel uh, coming out of your technical background, skill set, schooling, whatever it was? Were you like, hey, I want to definitely work in the family business or did you get dragged in or did you just do it out of necessity? What was, what was the reasoning? Uh, kind of a combination of all of the above that you mentioned there. So I mean, I was exposed to this from when I was just a, a young young boy, when I was literally riding my big wheel around in the warehouse while my parents were working. And then uh, I went to school to become an optical engineer at the University of Rochester. So the whole idea was that uh, groomed me to become second generation. And then um, I think, you know, I, I kind of learned the business along the way. I, this was not a silver spoon treatment where a guy goes to college and has never stepped a day in the business and then comes in as a management level. I was working weekends, you know, cleaning machines, uh, learning how to operate the machines, how to fix the machines, how to run the R&D department, and incrementally worked my way up through the ranks so that uh, to today where we have a lot of long-term employees that have watched me grow along with the company, and there's a very good synergistic of a feeling between the whole group because they know that I put my time and effort in to obtain the position that I'm in today. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So um, uh, just to point out to our users, some of our users are first time business owners, sometime are family generational businesses. But in your case, I think you just keyed on a couple of things that help a business get through the generational transfer. One is you had to earn it. Right. <laughs> and by earning it, the people around you never saw it as a, a silver spoon in your mouth. And so therefore, when the original founder leaves and the new founder or the new president comes in, the, the, the power transfer is much easier because the people respect you because you've correct. done the job. And so, so for those of our listeners that are thinking about a generational transition, take notes from Brian, the family has done it well, right? Make your kids earn it, right? Make your kids earn it because then their employee, your employees will respect them. So awesome. I appreciate you sharing that perspective, Brian. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so then since it's been so easy for you, uh, I'll ask a different question. What kind of challenges are you facing today? Like you, you've gone through the process, but there's probably new business challenges. So what are you facing today? Let me kind of answer that in two parts. So it's it hasn't always been easy. Um, because the business model started in a certain way and it was just the eyeglasses, sunglasses that was being the focus of the business while my dad was at the helm, uh, they got caught in a trap of being, we were the only company in town doing that, the only company in the United States doing that. So for a while, we were almost like a monopoly doing that service for everybody within the country. At that time, there was no lens crafters and Pearl Visions and all these other guys out there that can now do their own coatings. So they rested on their laurels and were not forward thinking. That was a mistake. Um, 
they were under the impression that they were invulnerable to uh, competition, which started creeping up and they weren't keeping their eyes on the radar. So uh, it got to the point where the company was very close to going under because they just were not paying attention and, and keeping on track of things. So, uh, you know, my father, I give him 100 percent credit for having the, the, you know, the bandwidth and the, and the courage to start his, comp his own company. Uh, it was a partnership with another company that he ended up buying out. But then they kind of got caught in the easy in the easy lane, I will, if you will. So I've watched the company struggle significantly several times. And uh, right after I got out of school and the company was probably in one of its worst places ever, I saw that there was opportunities being missed. Things were not being handled the way I thought maybe that there was a better way to do it. So, uh, you know, I don't mean any real disrespect with this, but I often tell people I've learned a lot from my father on what not to do in business. And uh, that's something that all entrepreneurs should be aware of is that, you know, not every model is correct. And even if you're working off a previously successful model, it may need changes. It may need to be tweaked to be successful in today, today's atmosphere. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. And so business isn't always easy. You've gone through some ups and downs as a business and you've had to pivot, change directions, add new verticals into your offering, new, new industries to serve, all different kinds of things that it sounds like you guys have gone through. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. And that, again, is another one of those, hey, if you're going to survive, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, your market space is probably going to change. Uh, you were a monopoly and suddenly there was a competition and you almost got caught sleeping at the wheel. That's right. right. So excellent job. Another another uh, good learning from our for our list, listeners perspective is always be open to what the pivot needs to be next. Absolutely. So. Um, so, yeah. So what are some common misconceptions about running a business? So it sounds like you've been at this for a little while, the transition process, but you probably came into the business with some kind of beliefs around what was this going to be like? What, what were you wrong about? Um, I think. For me, it was, you know, watching the ups and downs of the of the company has been, you know, a learning experience the whole way around. So I don't know that I necessarily had the same misconceptions, but a lot of my friends are also small business owners. And we've talked about things like this in the past. And we sometimes joke about, you know, some of the misconceptions that, that other people have, whether it's the employees or just friends of ours. And I think some of them are that you can just delegate everything and you don't have to do much work. You're just sitting in the big office on the top floor and that um, everyone's doing everything for you and you're just you know, telling people what to do. And, and maybe that is the way it is for some people, but that is not the way it is here. Uh, I like to have my hands in everything. I think information is power and knowledge is the way you have to be able to look at data and take day-to-day -day activities and understand what your, what your business is doing on every level to be truly successful and being able to pivot when you need to pivot. So um, being involved and staying involved uh, at some level. Now, at that same token, I don't want to be involved only in the business. Obviously, I want to be involved on the business. That's a good cliche thing, but it's very true. And that's what I'm doing a lot more now that I've got a good, strong, strong management team at the highest level below me to make sure that the day-to-day -day operations are functioning as they should while I kind of look at the other, other new growth opportunities for the business. Um, another kind of one, which is kind of in line with that, is that it's easy. It's easy to be the boss because, you, again, you're not really doing anything. And that it's easy because, hey, there's always work coming in. And so the, the employees are always busy and business is good. But the work doesn't just flow in by magic. There's a lot of work behind the scenes that's being done by other groups, the sales and marketing team, by going to trade shows, by you know, getting out there and making sure that people know what you have, why it's good, and what differentiates you from your competitors. So you know, don't just take it for granted that you know, if you see work flowing into a company that it's just coming there because it's always going to come in. There's constant struggle to make sure that you maintain a solid workflow in and out of the business. And I guess the last one I was thinking about was that given the opportunity, anybody could be the boss. Well, people have limitations and understanding your limitations, your strengths and your own weaknesses and being open, honest and vulnerable to discuss those and, and fess up to them will lead you to the best path of success. I don't always want to be the smartest person in the room, but I want to have the smartest people in the room with me. So in some cases, depending on what it is, there are people far better than I am to discuss a particular topic or have a specific path of uh, employment or, or a strategy or a marketing idea. It's getting all the people and all the brain power together, harnessing that, that solid basis of knowledge and using it to the best of your ability. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I appreciate all those thoughts. And it's uh, really well spoken in the in the list that you gave us there. So thank you. So um, so you mentioned also, and we've talked about this already, but you mentioned also that at one point you had to help pivot the company because there was 
maybe innovation was dying a little bit. You were a little bit lazy. And so how do you make sure as a business that you don't fall asleep at the wheel again? Like how do you, this, everything's constantly changing in business. So what kind of strategies do you keep in place to not fall asleep at the wheel or to remain innovative? It's probably the right word. Sure. Um, so I'm constantly reviewing the way we do it. You know, what, what bothers me the most is when I ask somebody, why are you doing it that way? Because oh, that's the way we've always done it. Well, is that the best way to do it? Is there a better way? So I empower all my employees to every time we have a group meeting and we talk about something, I'm like, what could be done better in your area? What's what's slowing you down? What can be more efficient? What what do you need? What tools does a company could they offer you to make your job better, easier, faster, more profitable, cut expenses, whatever it is? And I we listen to everybody um, from you know every single level of the company and making sure that you're always aware of that. Just because it's the way we've done it is not necessarily the best way to do it is a very important thing to consider. Um, I'm also not afraid to try things. Um, so, you know, you mentioned change. Change is a scary word to many people, um, even many entrepreneurs. Uh, people just don't like the idea of change. I embrace change. Uh, I don't fear it. I, I think change is, is always a good thing to look at. Don't be afraid to try something because if you do, you might miss out on an opportunity and you'll be the last one to the game that's missed out on that opportunity. And then um, this is kind of a tangential one, but including in the change and staying on top of things is you got to look internally sometimes. Sometimes there's people within your organization that are toxic people. And uh, we ran into this not a very long time ago that there was a, prop, a person in, a, in an upper level, man, upper management level position that um, it took a while to realize was really not doing much of anything. It was more of a toxic person. So we strategically um, were able to separate from that person. And uh, once we did so, even months and, and now a year later, we're still seeing some of the damage that was done. So if you've got a, to a toxic work environment or a person that's causing a toxic work environment, you cannot tolerate that. And uh, and I can go more into about culture if you've got a question about that, but that's a big part of this as well. Yeah, so let's follow up with that. So tell me about your culture. How do you how do you keep your employees engaged and what does that look like? Well, culture, from my perspective, culture is the most important thing in your business. It outweighs the skills and the talent that you could bring in because if you've got a person that's the best salesperson, but they don't get along with anybody else in the company, that's not going to be a successful arrangement. So first you have to identify what your culture is. You need to understand who you are as a business, what your, what your mission statement is, and maybe what your core values are. And from our core value perspective and our mission statement, we don't just come up with these you know, catchy things you hear on a TV jingle or something like that. We, we use a strategic way to drive what our core values are. Um, so you know, driving your core values, making sure that everybody in your business is, fits those core values, evaluating people on those core values and their ability to meet those core values and being very consistent is, is what leads to a, a positive and successful culture. Um, I also believe that you have to have fun in the workplace. You spend more time with your workmates than you often do your own family, especially as an entrepreneur or an early on entrepreneur. So, you know, you got to get work done, but you can have fun in it. And, you know, I read a book once called The Fish Philosophy, and it's about the Pike Place fish market in Seattle, where people throw the fish around and they have a good time doing their work, but they're still getting the work done. I actually had every one of my employees read that book, and it was just to try to understand that, you know, we're all together, we have a common culture, we have a common goal, and let's try to have some fun doing it, be lighthearted, and uh, just get the job done. So we do a lot of, like, fun things for the, for the, uh, for all the employees, we'll have like we contests where we all do we bowling and whoever wins the whole tournament gets a, an extra vacation day and things like that. But people look forward to these things. We have a very, very high retention rate. We don't have anybody ever leave our company. And I can attribute that to the culture that we've been able to develop and just the family nature of how we operate our business. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for sharing all that detail. We appreciate that, Brian. So, um, so let me take a step forward. Uh, could you just give us a glimpse into your future plans and goals for your business? Maybe take a step into what your future plans and goals are even in, involved in the business. Sure. So business-wise, um, right now I'm in a very strong growth mode. I, you know, you should always be in a strong growth mode, but you get caught up in day-to-day -day operations and things. And right now I'm like, like I said, I'm working more on the business, which is what I should be doing is as the president and CEO. And I'm, so right now I'm looking at acquisitions. And in fact, we're just about to 
close our first acquisition in company history um, this week, which is exciting. So, but we're looking at growth. So we're looking at from acquisition standpoint, we're looking at organic growth. We're also looking at new markets uh, and one of those being the European market. We have customers in Europe. Um, so I asked myself, why are these companies in Europe using our services? You know, trying to understand what value we're bringing to them is then something that you can market. You know, understanding why your customers come to you and asking those questions sometimes will provide you your own marketing material without having to try to be creative and come up with it. They're going to tell you what the marketing material is. So the growth right now is, is the number one thing on the company. And, and part of the growth and part of being a successful entrepreneur and a successful long-term, and I, this is a, one of my strongest beliefs in all of business and life, is it's all based on relationships. Relationships are the fundamental glue that holds everything together. The stronger the relationship you can have with not only customers, employees, vendors, professional partners, you know, attorneys, lawyers, accountants, uh, everything like that, the better your relationships are, the better everything is. And it gets to the point where, you know, you've got a really good customer and you've got a really great relationship with them and inevitably some small hiccup in the road goes in production or something. That becomes just a small little trick, you know, bump in the road rather than a mountain you've got to climb over if you don't have that relationship. And those relationships are paramount. And they've also helped me to down this path of acquisition. They've helped me find uh, new customers. We get such good relationships with current customers and this is the best, this makes me the happiest of any type of sales or marketing thing is that in our, in the optics and photonics industry that we're in, there's a lot of people that move between companies. Mm -hmm. Nothing makes me happier than when we have a great relationship with a customer and one of their employees that we work with then moves to another company and they get to the new company and they said, Hey, who do you guys use for your optical coatings? And they say, well, we use XYZ company. And they say, no, no, no. You need to use North American coding laboratories. They're the best. They're selling for me. I mean, there's nothing better than that. So that is like the ultimate, you know, that's the best thing I can I can tell you from a sales and marketing perspective that nothing makes me happier than that. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. And I would agree with you. When you have a customer that goes to a new company and brings you along with them, that's a it's a it's a big win usually. And it's a it's a nice day for you. So I love that one. So you've been dropping what I would call nuggets of truth, nuggets of advice throughout the podcast, but I'll ask the question anyways, towards the, as the last question I'll ask, which is what advice would you give to an aspiring entrepreneur or maybe someone that's struggling to get their business started today? So a couple of things, and uh, these are some like kind of catchphrases I live by, but I, I blurt them out all the time is, I don't believe that there's any such thing as problems. There's only opportunities. So when something goes wrong, don't look at it like, oh, we've got a problem. Yes, it's a problem. I understand. We, But take a look at that problem and say, what was the base of the problem? Why was it a problem? And what are we going to do to prevent, prevent this from happening again in the future? So from that perspective, it's an opportunity to be better. Um, another one I like to say is if you're not growing, you're dying. So getting stagnant, getting stale, just going along with the day-to-day, -day, no good. And that's both personally and professionally. I, you know, I read, I'm a very voracious reader. I read a lot of different business books. Um, you know, I get a lot of my insight and motivation out of hearing a variety of people talk about the way that they've learned through businesses. And there's dozens of books out there that, you know, will touch on any subject that you may have interest in. Um, a really great quote that I love is, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. I got to, we need more sets of numbers. We got to, at a certain point, you just have to make a decision. You have to press the go button. You got to, don't be wishy-washy. If you're an entrepreneur, Make a decision. If you make the wrong decision, own it. Admit that you made the wrong decision. Learn from it. Don't make it again. And then move on. But not making a decision is worse than making a bad decision, in my perspective. And then you have to have accountability across the board, from top to bottom, including myself. Now, I believe in extreme ownership. It's a good book if you haven't read it. Yeah, but great the bottom book. line is, you know, ultimately, the ownership of everything that goes on here is mine. So... I, if I'm not willing to take that responsibility, then then that's a problem. You know, if uh, well, if somebody down the line had the problem, why did they have the problem? What what could we have done better to support them from having that problem? And if I don't, and if it's just something that that person is just not a good employee, and I don't get rid of that person, then well, that's still my problem. Mm -hmm. So you got to have accountability across. And if you don't have accountability, you won't get results. And another thing I've learned is that when you set objectives, and you talk to your team about those objectives, and everybody's like, yeah, we're going to get that done. Make sure you've got 
target dates. Don't just assume that it's going to be done because you said it's going to get done. Otherwise, things will go on forever. Target dates don't have to be firm, and it's not like you're going to shoot somebody if they don't get it done by the target date. But if it's not done by the target date, you just say, hey, can you help me understand why you didn't get there? What can I do to help you get there? You know, what other things can we do to, are there other things on your plate that are taking away from you get to this? And, and then this kind of all stems back to the EOS thing, which has rocks and the highest level goals and things like that, that I could spend a whole other podcast talking about. But just make sure you've got objectives with target dates. And I think those are the kind of the key things for me that I would say get you, get you in the right path. Awesome. Well, thank you so much today for your time, Brian. We really appreciate you joining the show. It was great meeting you and learning more about your entrepreneurial journey, your success. Congratulations on everything going on. Congratulations on your first acquisition. Hopefully that comes to fruition. Uh, to everyone watching and listening, we appreciate you being here. We look forward to the next episode. And Brian, thanks again. My pleasure. Okay, that should be a good enough pause. Okay. I, I don't like I don't like the change that Zoom made. There used to be you like had to push record and then you would I mean I guess I could probably push stop on the recording, but it right. just was simpler. Uh it was easier that way. Gotcha. Anyways, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um so yeah, so it'll take a couple of weeks generally to get everything processed and then you'll see it come up. If I catch it, I'll let you know, but just keep an eye on your LinkedIn feed. If you see it, it should pop up obviously. Cool. Uh, with your name in it. All right, great. Um, you, you mentioned a couple things uh, that, you know, it sounds like you've got a lot of stuff together. You do a lot of reading. You're on top of a lot of things. Um, first acquisition can be a little bit scary. Um, and I'll, the other thing I would ask you and potentially challenge you with is what's your end game look like, right? I know you're just getting into the seat or at least getting taken ownership over. Are you thinking that far ahead of advance? And if you like to have a follow-up conversation, I would love to talk to you about that. But um yeah, otherwise, I, if you I think you're a good spot. I, I can easily answer that question. And I know the podcast, we didn't want to go long on it, but I was prepared to talk about that. So people ask me, you know, so you know when you're going to retire, what's, what's your end game? What's, what's, what's your next thing that you're going to do? And earlier on, I would have told you, hey, I want to be retired by a specific date, 55, 50, whatever that date is. But, but the more that I've been running the business on my own, which really didn't start since, until 2018, that I, my father finally stopped dangling the carrot out there. And I was able to actually you know, do things the way I thought they should be done with no, no, it was completely my thing. Um, the more I've been able to do that and the more successful the company's been, and the more successful the company's been, the more driven I become and the more motivated I become. So to me now, the answer is not, it's like, well, when are you going to stop doing this? And my answer to that is when well, it's no longer fun. I love what I'm doing. I'm having fun. I look forward to coming here every day. I look forward to the challenges, the successes, you know, the struggles, it's all for, for me, problem solving, coming up with, be, you know, with better ways to do things. I love this stuff. But at a certain point, you know, there's going to be, be the opportunity or, or, you know, best case scenario. You know, we have more customers, some of our customers are Apple and Google and Meta and these huge companies. If one of them decides to drop a golden parachute in my lap and makes me an offer I can't refuse, I'm not going to say no. Right. But it's so beyond that. So what do you do after that? Well, my style is not one to just sit back and do nothing. I'm, I'm, constantly in motion. I mean, I, from the time I get up till the time I go to sleep, even on vacations, I'm not a peach and, a beach and pool guy. I'm a guy, let's go hiking, let's go check this out. So for me, because of what I've been able to do with our company and help some friends out with their company struggling, I think I'd really like to be a turnaround guy. Nice. You know, come into a struggling company, use my skill set that I've been able to develop over the last many years, help to take a look at things, turn their company around and create another success. That, that to me would be a very enjoyable and rewarding next step for me. Got it. Got it. Excellent. No. Well, appreciate you sharing that as well. And uh, that won't be in our podcast because well, I, I gave the gap, but I appreciate you sharing that with me. Absolutely. So uh, again, thank you for your time, Brian. Appreciate it. Keep an eye out for us on social media and please listen to some of the other podcasts. I'm not, uh, the, the podcast is actually called On It, Not In It. So okay. it's interesting that you threw that out three or four times <laughs> yeah. during our discussion. So, uh, yeah, so excellent. Have a great day. Thank you for your time today, Brian. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate it. Yep. See you. Bye now.